10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good golly, Miss Molly. Welcome to the inaugural Cult Comedy Crew, a new series of shows. Initially aimed at being monthly, I'm going to fit these into the cycle of shows so we get a bit of variety, and where we are going to celebrate and explore the classic comedy series and movies, mainly TV, we'll do the odd movie series, of the past, and we'll look into the origins of these shows, the people who created them, and all the best bits we can find that YouTube's copyright system allows us to show. And believe you me, for today's show, I have struggled for a day and a half to get clips that are not blocked on this particular show by YouTube and largely failed in that endeavor. So thank you to our glorious um, keepers at YouTube. Um, but thank you for joining us, everybody on YouTube and Rumble today. Uh, if you don't mind smashing or caressing or mellying that like button and sharing out the stream, it all helps. And it's great to see you all here. We will uh, be hopefully chatting to you all throughout the show. As you can, uh, those of you who have seen Blackadder can quote your best bits um, and your favorite insults and other such pieces from the show. It's a show that promises to be packed full of insults uh, and pithy sayings and sizzling gypsies, I think, will also be a feature <laughs> of today's show. Um, but before we get on to that, I would like to welcome today uh, to the show, helping keep me on track here, uh, my great friends, Imperitus and John. So, Imp, how are you today, my friend? Uh, I'm doing all right. I've had better weeks, as I've told you. But other than that, uh, not too bad. Not too bad. Good. I'm, I'm glad to hear that, son. Thank you for being here. I know you're not that familiar with uh, Black Hat. No, Black not at all. I mean, at the, I know people who've seen the show and have talked about the show, and I've seen clips and heard some of the insults and so on and so forth, but for whatever reason, it was never on my list of things like, oh, maybe I should watch that. Well, I would certainly recommend it, and I think it is available for a physical. Oh, I, I can find it. A bunch I have no problems yeah. finding things. Yeah, and we'll talk about each season during the show and which ones are, are well, they're all good, although the first one is probably less good, if we could put it that way. Uh, <laughs> many first yeah. seasons are of shows. Um, so, yeah, I mean, as, as Davina says, there's only six episodes per show, so pretty easy to get through, and they're oh, all not like, bad half an hour long yeah uh, and there are three specials as well and there may be some other stuff out there but there's three main specials that they made the way people talked about the show i figured it'd be uh, like multiple seasons double digits per episodes per season and see, i know the christmas special yeah it's um, back black and Adder's, forth black Adder's christmas carol is one of yeah, the christmas specials. carol yeah we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves a little Sorry. In a sense no, no, it's okay, mate. And then, because I'm, I'm six pages behind you. Um, <laughs> and then there was the Cavalier Years, Blackout Out, the Cavalier Years, set during the Charles I era. And then there was the Back and Forth special. Yeah. We will talk about those later. They fitted those into the sort of the historical gaps of the four main seasons. And in effect, created a, a Blackout Chronicles of History. 
which we'll get into. So, but John, you're you are here and you've seen Blackadder, so welcome, yes. my friend. <laughs> yeah, I I watched Blackadder a long time ago, um, not well, not that long ago, but uh, yeah, I think I first I'm trying to remember when I first saw it because I think I think I saw some episodes on PBS, on the mm. late late night PBS stuff. And but I didn't see the whole Black Adder until it, you know, you know, it's like on DVD. Yeah, and it's hard to believe that it's a show that that ended in effect, although one of the specials ended thirty years ago, thirty plus yeah. years ago now. So, so yeah, um, we're we're certainly going to get into that and the ethos of this particular series of shows. I just like to so welcome everyone here. Uh, we have, uh, and he was very, very early, FKHC2005, good to see you. Lots of good chat from you, my friend, uh, and erudite gentleman, indeed. Uh, Davina is here. She has a cunning plan. Is it a plan so cunning that it's got a degree in cunning at Oxford? Because that's <laughs> a cunning plan. <laughs> you could pin a, could you pin a tail on it and call it a fox? <laughs> Um, because cunning plans were the, one of the basic tropes of the show. Everyone had yeah. a cunning plan. Um, who else is here? Well, Davina's obviously here. Uh, let me scroll through these names. Smilex, good to see you. Davina's here, pops on cologne. <laughs> and you should always wear cologne. Davina, has, Davina, has, Davina rightly says they struck the right tone of absurdity and pathos for the finale of Black Adder Goes Forth. Again, getting ahead of yep. myself. To me, it's one of the finest, if not arguably the finest ending to a comedy or indeed any television show ever. And that's a big statement, but I think it could could arguably be the best ever ending. Um, Christian is here. Bonjour. Mon ami. Comment allez-vous? Comment ça va? Comment allez-vous is a bit formal. Comment ça va? Good to see you, my friend. Um, and you are a mod, that's true. D Bud Martin, the mod of mods is here. The mentor of mods, the mod father. Good to see you, D Bud. Uh, we have scrolls, scrolls faster, scrolls faster. Uh, Anima, hello, lass. How are you? Good to see Anima Confusa. Uh, Sean Estep is here. Great to see you, Sean. Uh, if I miss anyone, forgive me. I'm sure we'll catch up with you later and we will be looking for your best. Um, and you know it is here. Good to see you again. You know it. Your best. And Danny, somebody called Danny Munchausen is here. Um, you know, I could say, if I was being unfair, that Darius is not suitable to be on this panel because he would bore the leggings off a village idiot. <laughs> <laughs> but that would be something Blackadder would say. I wouldn't say that. Yeah. Darius. I would never say that. Blackadder forever. Uh, yeah, and and um, FKC he talks about the last mesh, mash episode. There are similarities. I think there's there's a more there's more um, path, uh, more more emotion, even more emotion in the Blackadder one. But we'll definitely get to that. So. So what? What? Uh, before we start, though, our great friend Courtney isn't here today, but she was out last night partying. Now, as you know, Courtney is a is a rocker. She's been in many bands. She's one of my favorite bass players. Her and Susie Quattro. I do love a a girl bass player. So, uh, if she doesn't mind, I'm going to share a little clip of her singing and performing last night in a bar somewhere with various members of the circle jerks and the dickies and lots of other people so let's sure. uh, let's take a look at courtney knocking it out of the park Look at that move, those moves. <laughs> Look at those moves. <laughs> well played, Courtney. 
I'm so I would so love to have been there to see that. That's just freaking awesome. Yeah. What a great last she is. So that looks like a lot of fun. She's channeling Joan Jet, mad reputation. I think she's doing kick ass job there. Well played. So love you, Courtney. Uh, we'll see you here back here next week, I'm sure, for next week's show, which of course, trailing in advance, is our special interview and um, chat with the, the magnificent legend that is Graham Bonnet. So we're going to have a brilliant show next week. So excited about that. So uh, we have already got some some um, people taking pity on me and <laughs> donating. We have a sticker from Darius, $1.49 from Darius, which is, of course, a box of popcorn. And being Darius, he does get the traditional clip. Take him to Detroit. No! No, not Detroit! No! No, please! Anything with that! No! I have to tell you, the Kentucky Fried Movie is on the list of shows we will be doing in this series at some point. When we'll get to it, I don't know, but it is on the list. Uh, but also our great friend and supporter of the channel, Christian DeLorme, $10 Canadian from Christian Delorme. Your best quote ever, Brian. I got to shake hands with the unemployed. <laughs> I do that every time I go to the bathroom. <laughs> yeah. Um, as long as you wash your hands afterwards. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So thank you for that, Christian. It's great to have you here. Um, and you too get a clip. Maybe we'll try and play something new for you. What have we got? Oh, yeah, because I'm, you know, I, I tend to talk a lot and dissemble, so it should, people should be shouting this. Get on with it. Yes, get on with it. Get on with it. <laughs> so we will indeed get on with it. And but, uh, thanks, Christian, buddy. Good to see you. Yeah, Catholic high school girls in trouble, one of my favorite sections of Kentucky Fried Movie. One that we may have trouble showing on here. Yeah. No, never. <laughs> he is rough and toothless. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, the, just before we dive into Blackadder, the, this this cult comedy crew, I mean, what, something I've been wanting to do for a long time. And in fact, I'd started planning this a couple of years ago in some detail with a group that included Toxic Man Flu and Matt Foulball and uh, Davina, uh, not Davina, sorry. Danielle Lafave. Um, and we had it all mapped out and then it came to the point where I was going to have to create like opening intros and graphics and actually plan shows and then things went sideways because of doing lots of other shows. So I figured let's get this thing in the diagonal and we'll do it. This is the inaugural cult comedy crew with a C, not the K. <laughs> it's comedy, not black metal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not black metal. Uh, and the intention is that um, going forward, we'll pro do one of these, say, monthly, and then we'll be doing a Canon Film uh, Club monthly, and we'll be doing it, and it's only talk and roll with music focus monthly, and then maybe, you know, whatever we throw into the other gaps in between. Uh, so that's kind of the plan going forward. So we'll be doing some kind of cult comedy. A lot of it will be British, I hate to tell you now, because British television shows, comedy shows are... Uh, something I obviously grew up with, but there will be US and Canadian and even the old Australian thing here and there. Um, and there's a big list and obviously we'll take down all your other suggestions and we'll work on those. And what we're going to do is talk about the origins of the show, the lineage, if you like, the family tree. Because if you look at something like Monty Python, well, there wasn't. it just didn't start in a vacuum. All those guys did stuff before and were influenced by stuff. And we'll talk about the show itself and we'll talk about things these people went on to do and hopefully show a lot of the best bits. And I did run in today, I apologize, there are going to be very few clips today because Blackadder and YouTube, BBC and YouTube, block almost everything. I've spent about 12 hours trying to prepare clips for the show. I've managed to get a tiny number that I can do. Um, but yeah, they're blockers, not even claimers blockers. So it's it's going to be tricky to do that. We will get the young ones. We may even get bottom eventually because Rick Mail, who's obviously magnificent as Lord Flashart in Blackadder, is is somebody and the young uh, somebody I'm particularly keen on. R.I.P. Rick, of course, died a few yeah. years ago, sadly. Um, 
So black. I have a plan. You have it's a, as hot as my pants. It's, it's, it's as hot as my pants. <laughs> I think I might have that actual look. I've got a lot of flash <laughs> art clips that I managed to fit into the montages I did for each season. So we'll be like, am I pleased to see you or did I just put a canoe in my pocket? It's another one of his. <laughs> and there's going to be a lot of those. So, so Blackadder. Today we're going to talk about classic British sitcom Blackadder. Uh, the show follows the misadventures of the Blackadder family who mainly appear to be called Edmund from generation to generation. But Blackadder himself is a cunning and cynical character. He appears in various historical eras throughout the series. Um, uh, each season is set in a different period of British history, ranging from the Middle Ages, certainly the 14, 1500s, up to World War I, and then a little bit of beyond that when we got to one of the specials. And the character of Blackadder is always scheming and trying to advance his position in society, but often finds himself foiled by partly his own um, ambitions, but also his dim-witted sidekicks and the absurdities of the time. So many historical characters are portrayed in the show, usually well out of the exact timeline that they were really in, uh, and not always too kindly and... Uh, you know, to me, it's a comedic masterpiece that transcended the sitcom format. I mean, it's it, it's history, it's comedy, it's satire, it's slapstick. Um, it's got a bit of everything in it. Uh, it's verbal, it's physical. Uh, it's one of these just it's great series that managed to... to not only, not only include a lot of knob jokes, as Ben Elton, the writer, would put it, but managed to then also fit in satire and comments on the politics and characters of the time without ever lecturing, hectoring, uh, or even diverting from the comedy. Uh, so it, it, how they achieved that balance is an, is an amazing thing. Um, it comprised, The show comprised them four main seasons and three one-off specials. Uh, the four main seasons were broadcast on the BBC, BBC One between 1983 and 1989. I do believe they showed them in PBS over here. Uh, and the last of the three specials was released in 1999. So it's been a while since it was on, but it's still a very fresh and very beloved show that is endlessly qu quotable. I could recommend right now, actually, there's a book I have. There were multiple books about the show. This is possibly the closest to an authorized book with extensive interviews and contributions from everybody involved the true history of the black adder and it does feature things like a black adder family chronology or lineage which i do have a, an image of which i'll show later so things like that and it does talk about stuff like that as well as talking about yeah. the making of the show so great book um so it's beloved in Britain. And by season four, Blackadder goes forth, it peaked at 10 to 12 million viewers per episode, which is pretty substantial. It's a brilliant blend of comedy and historical satire. It's got slapstick in it, as I say, and as writer Ben Elton put it, it's got lots of knob jokes <laughs> and biting witty satire. And because it was set in a historical setting, it allowed them to do a lot that they couldn't do if it was set in the present day. Uh, lots of attacking of British society and British history. Um, I just, you know, it, it took flawed, flawed historical characters, but also put them against historical events. And Blackadder just seems to be at the centre of many of those events, the character or the family of Blackadder. Um, as I say, they mixed the timelines up quite a bit at times, um, but, you know, that's artistic license. And it lampooned aristocracy, bureaucracy, war, and politics. A pretty scathing commentary on power dynamics. Uh, and it saw the evolution of the Black Adder character from basically a sort of witless weasel in the first season to a pretty smart, urbane, witty, and indeed somewhat caring guy in the fourth season. Well, he cared whether his insults landed or not. <laughs> 
very sharp and witty, witty writing by Richard Curtis and, and from season two onwards, Ben Elton. Um, very intelligent and very sharp dialogue. It's rife with wordplay, puns, one-liners. I mean, the one-liners, I got pages of them here because I can't remember them all. Um, but, you know, just page after page of insults and one-liners. You know, the eyes are open, the mouth moves, but Mr. Brain has long since departed, hasn't he, Percy? <laughs> <laughs> oh, and this Queenie says in, in the second season, Queen Elizabeth says to him, oh, Ed Edmund, I do love it when you get cross. Sometimes I think about having you executed just to see the expression on your face. <laughs> but, I mean, and the flash art stuff is just hilarious. So hopefully we'll oh, yeah. remember, yeah, hopefully we'll remember some of those as we go. I mean, John, you've, you've, Got experience with a lot of the the one liners in these, so oh yeah. We'll Plus, be... I pulled up, I pulled up some too. So. All right, good. So they just keep feeding them in there as um, as appropriate. So, um, so where did this show come from? Who were the main guys in it? Uh, so first of all, off the main main one of the main drivers of the show and creators of it is, was Rowan Atkinson. English actor, comedian, and writer, um, obviously still thankfully with us, and a man of interesting opinions, many of which I agree with. Um, but he's obviously a big campaigner these days for free speech because, as he said, you couldn't make a black adder now probably because of the, the jokes in it, you know. Yeah. Um, he got his big break, um, which I remember at the time very much enjoying in a show where well, he had done things before that, a show called Not the Nine O'Clock News with um, Griffiths Jones, Mel Smith, and Pamela Stevenson, Billy Connolly's wife to this day. Um, so this was the time of, of what they would call alternative comedy in Britain. So punk was around the new wave and comedy went through a similar, um, similar, uh, what's the word, a transformation. Yeah. Um, and this was one of the main shows for that. It featured news, satirical news items, songs, uh, you know, some very funny songs. I like the one about tr I like trucking and I like to truck. <laughs> about truckers. <laughs> Maybe talking about something else. I don't know. Uh, very funny show, sketch based. And Rowan Atkinson was a big uh, part of that, along with um, Richard Curtis, who we're going to talk about briefly um, as well in a minute. So brilliant show, got these guys a lot of attention. Obviously, Rowan Atkinson went on to, to bigger fame and fortune. Smith and Jones did have various TV shows and even a movie afterwards. Maybe didn't quite reach the same heights. Uh, Pamela Stevenson got married to Billy Connolly and then became a psychologist. So uh, she got out of the business. <laughs> um, she did have one famous sketch in the 9 o'clock news, though, where she bared her chest. It was a spoof American Express advert. <laughs> where she said, and the guy goes, American Express, she goes, thank you, sir, that'll be nicely, because that was the adverts at the time. And would you like to rub my tits and so as well? So, <laughs> so got a lot of that one got a lot of um, controversy at the time. But, uh, Morons from Outer Space was the movie that Smith and Jones did with Jimmy Neal starring in that as well. It wasn't a hit. It wasn't a bad movie, though. I do like Jimmy Neal. But I'd like the idea of that, which was the aliens don't have to be smart. I mean, it's like not everybody that drives a car knows how to create, to, to build a car. Right. So you don't have to be smart to invent it and drive it. <laughs> the aliens were just pretty dumb. They were basically out in a shopping expedition. Um, so Rowan Atkinson, amongst many others, also, if you ever see these, there's a lot of them on album and, and uh, video, The Secret Policeman's Ball, which was a series of comedy shows. Uh, live shows that were done for charity, for Amnesty International, in fact. Uh, Rowan Atkinson did some brilliant sketches on those. Um, he's a very great physical comedian, but also great with words and verbal uh, play and, and accents and voices. So he, he could do some brilliant stuff. You can see John Cleese and Peter Cook, Billy Connolly, Michael Palin, guys like that were in this. And they did a lot of music stuff with Jeff Beck, Eric Clapton and guys. So guys like that. So if you ever see, get the chance to watch these, they're really good. It's like a kind of greatest hits of British comedy and music at the time, you know. Um, then, of course, he went on to Mr. Bean. Huge international success. Very cleverly 
using the silent comedy thing so it could sell all around the world you don't have to speak english very little dialogue in it at all um and very physical comedy uh using a lot of physical comedy and then of course his um spoof um james bond uh johnny english i do like the poster he knows nothing <laughs> yeah well, imp is back hey imp we're back happened there something yeah, so Johnny English has been a bit of a success for him. Yeah, the physical comedy, as Smilek says in the uh, policeman's, secret policeman's ball gigs were, was brilliant. Um, he did have a stab at Bond, though. Not playing James Bond, of course, but he was in the Sean Connery Never Say Never Again. So yeah. as well as spoofing Bond, he's been in a Bond, albeit the... The red-headed stepchild of Bond. <laughs> That's right, <laughs> He does say that his performance is the worst thing about it. So, And that's saying a lot. And that's saying a lot, yeah. Now, recently, though, I mean, I say recently, I mean in the last 10 years, he has done something that I recommend anyone would check out, and it's the show Maigret, where he plays the uh, French detective. Uh, I think he did two seasons. I'm not sure if there was a third or fourth. These are available on streaming somewhere. Absolutely brilliant portrayal. Uh, set in France of the 1930s. Uh, serious role, obviously. Uh, you know, straight, uh, he plays him with such warmth and intelligence. Uh, you wouldn't know it's the same guy as Bean. It's just absolutely beautiful show. Love it. I wish, I, I, I hope they make more one day because he's so good in it and they were so well made. Uh, so I enjoyed that very much. So his main, one of his main collaborators in both the Not the Nine O'clock News and uh, Blackadder's Richard Curtis, British filmmaker, screenwriter, born in New Zealand, but he's a Brit, I guess he was uh, moved over back to Britain. Writer of Not the Nine O'clock News, then of course went on to do. Uh, well, there's another clip from Nine O'clock News with the leather. This is one of the musical numbers they did. I think it was a spoof punk thing. Um, then he wrote Four Weddings and a Funeral, huge hit, of course, with huge grunt in it. And Rowan Atkinson got a part in that as the yeah. minister, whatever you would call him, Reverend Notting Hill. Of course, he wrote, uh, so he's largely responsible for Hugh Grant's, um, um, what's the word, stardom persona. Ah. That was created in these movies, if you if you want to put it that way. Um, huge grunt, yeah. Um, and then he wrote and directed Love Actually, which not one of my favorite movies, but it was a big hit, you know, big success. Uh, Bill Nye, he was pretty good in it, but uh, you know, a lot of people like it. So, you know, what can you say? That there's no accounting for taste. There's no accounting for taste, yeah. Uh, but then obviously he has done all this stuff, including a show that I'm not really that familiar with. I wasn't that keen on, but big hit in Britain, Vicar of Dibley with Don French, uh, who also came out of that alternative comedy scene with Jennifer Saunders, who did absolutely fabulous later, of course. Uh, and very funny woman, Don French. This show I remember particularly for the fact that Johnny Depp appeared in one episode. So. Because she had a crush on Johnny Depp, and the real Johnny Depp appeared. He has a habit of appearing on British TV shows. He did the Fast Show and other stuff. So, so Richard Curtis, another prime mover in uh, in Blackadder. Uh, ben Elton was a key though, because he he wasn't involved at the beginning, but he came on board in season two as a co-writer, and that made a huge difference to the writing, in my opinion. From the first season, it just added a whole level of sharpness, wittiness, and of course, knob jokes. Yeah, um, <laughs> lots of knob jokes. Lots of knob jokes. So Ben Elton was uh, is a British comedian, author, playwright, and screenwriter. Again, came out of that alternative comedy scene as a stand-up. Did a lot of television, uh, but he's a sharp, sharp writer. He created and, and wrote the Young Ones, or co-wrote the Young Ones which had Rick Mail in it, obviously. Adrian Edmondson also appears in in, uh, in Blackadder, as, uh, well, particularly as uh, Baron von Richthofen in Blackadder Goes Forth. Great show, The Young Ones. Uh, absolutely loved it. 
some great music stuff in it too. Uh, he also, funnily enough, wrote We Will Rock You, the Queen musical, um, which obviously has made him a ton of cash. Uh, he's a political and sat satirical guy. He's very political, but he does it without ever getting over into the lecturing, and he always makes it funny. Comedy always comes first, but he's done stuff that isn't political at all, and like We Will Rock You. Uh, but another guy that was heavily involved, these are the key guys, uh, was um, John Lloyd, who's a longtime producer and writer, a uh, friend of Douglas Adams, and indeed flatmate of Douglas Adams for a while. Uh, he was involved with the radio version of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, uh, wrote, he's wrote and produced a bunch of stuff. Um, Spitting Image was one of his co-creations. Uh, you know, he's been around for a long time. BBC producer and the producer of other stuff too. So he actually, um, these are the four guys that really made this show and created it, uh, what it is today. But the origins, uh, I guess, of Black Adder particularly go back to this Rowan Atkinson radio show. Now, a lot of stuff in Britain started on radio, Radio 4 particularly, it's where Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy started. Have I Got News for You? Other major shows that became uh, big TV shows later. Um, this aired in 1978, and it was a Richard Curtis, Rowan Atkinson production. And basically, uh, Atkinson plays the part of four different made-up historical people. Uh, and it was his first, Rowan Atkins' his first kind of starring thing. And that gave the guys, because it was set in history, gave the, these two guys the idea to do something uh, later. And they decided they would collaborate on something which they then developed into Blackadder. Yeah. And they wanted a historical sitcom to be set in different periods. Um, and... They originally intended it to be a one-off special for what was called the Comic Strip Presents, which was a television, one of these alternative uh, comedy TV shows in the UK, and they had different episodes every week with different writers and, and whatever. And um, they intended it just to be a one-off for that, and they made a pilot. But the pilot was never got broadcast, and they ended up turning it into what became season one of, of the Black Adder. Um, the initial season really didn't get good reviews, and we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit. But playing, so they had this idea of set it in history, we can do more with that, and we can have this central conceit of this same guy or his family taking part in all these historical events. Um, now, Black Adder, sorry, I'll go back, that's Baldrick. Black Adder is played impeccably by uh, Rowan Atkinson. And he kind of, he, degives, he undergoes notable growth throughout these shows. The first one, he starts as pretty much a self-serving buffoon. He's the uh, Prince Regent to Richard IV after Edmund himself accidentally kills Richard III, his uncle, <laughs> in battle. Um, well, he's not really in battle. He's trying to avoid being in battle. Uh, and then by the end of it, he, become, he becomes, each season he becomes more sardonic and he's kind of sharp-witted and almost becomes an anti-hero. Um, very sympathetic, somewhat morally conflicted, so he doesn't always do bad things. Um, so that, I like that evolution of his character from a real ass in the first one and physically not appealing to... A guy that's really quite handsome in the subsequent seasons, you know. Um, I'm just looking for some quotes. <laughs> uh, Baldrick, your brain is so minute, Baldrick, that if a hungry cannibal cracked your head open, there wouldn't be enough to cover a small water biscuit. I was going to use that one when you got to Baldrick. <laughs> Oh well, well, I can find another Baldrick. That's right. Fine. So, so, so Blackadder is an ever-present. That there is an Edmund Blackadder throughout all of these, um, and he can adapt to the time periods and the social context. And he always, he's always ambitious, but but his ambitions do change uh, gradually as his family fortunes change too. But the other ever-present character, of course, is possibly even the one that people remember the most. 
I'm talking about the most is Baldrick. Baldrick, you would recognize a subtle plan if it painted itself purple and danced naked on a harpsichord singing, Subtle Plans Are Here Again. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you can even hear that subtle plans are here again. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so, hang on. Yes, I wanted to highlight this trip by Davina this kind of, which is that Rowan Atkinson's vacillation between a cowardly lickspittle and a bullying tyrant, often within the same scene, that made Blackadder so amusing. Indeed, yep. he, he was actually a very layered character. Not at the beginning, um, but he becomes a smile. He says he becomes a rock star by series two. I mean, he's actually good looking and attractive. And even throughout seasons two, three, and four, Attracts women, which the first season would never happen, you know. No. Um, albeit that he does condemn some of them to death afterwards by claiming they're German agents, but that's uh... <laughs> what he did to that nurse in season four. I don't think she even was the German agent. It was, it wasn't it, it was George was busy writing letters to his uncle in Germany, giving all these yeah. military secrets. <laughs> Yeah, oh, Alan Partridge is uh, absolutely brilliant. We're going to definitely talk Alan Partridge in a later edition of this show because it's one of my all-time favorite characters, for those who don't know. It's possibly one of the most obnoxious and yet amusing characters ever. So, uh, Baldrick, yeah, so Baldrick is, funnily enough, his family fortunes are entirely tied to the Black Adders. Um, quite how he ever rep reproduces, I'm not sure, but... Um, but he's in every season, always portrayed as a dim-witted, cunningly dim-witted and loyal sidekick to Blackadder. Sometimes I think he's just loyal because he's got no other choice. Um, he's an illiterate, simple-minded peasant. Um, he's got a distinctive, ragged appearance and, uh, and a lack of personal hygiene. <laughs> Uh, and he comes up with absurd and nonsensical ideas, hence, I have a cunning plan. Yep. Blackadder typically dismisses them unless he's got no other recourse, in which case he does adopt them. Um, and that he's basically, it's his catchphrase, although others say it, he's, I have a cunning plan. But, you know, while this season, again, he does go through a bit of a progression because his intelligence remains limited, but he gains a certain cunningness and adaptability, and he occasionally surprises Blackadder with the odd suggestion or insight that's pretty good, even, even if they're comically misguided sometimes. And um, he certainly occasionally shows some self-awareness, especially when he insults Blackadder off, when Blackadder's out of the scene. Yeah, but yeah, he's unsophisticated, um, but almost somehow in the middle of everything. I love the Black Arrow. I think in Black Arrow goes forth by the end when he's the private and he's the Batman. And I don't mean the superhero Batman. Yeah, Batman to Captain Black Arrow. Um, things like the bullet scene, which I wanted to show. Black Arrow says, "What are you doing with that bullet?" He says, "I'm carving on it." Where are you carving? I'm carving my own name. I'm carving Baldrick on it. Because I've often heard that somewhere out there, there's a bullet with your name on it. So I figured if I had it in my possession, I'm not likely to shoot myself. And then Blackadder goes, more's the pity. Or, you know, <laughs> it's things like that. So he's actually quite smart in some ways, but in a very weird way. You know? Yeah. He's a th I think he's a little bit um, smarter than Blackadder gives him credit for. Uh, he was played by Tony Robinson. Now, he wasn't actually, in this pilot they never aired, it wasn't Tony Robinson, it was some other guy that I don't know, and I'm glad, I've never seen the pilot, I'm glad they decided to change it. It's like the casting of Star Trek from the pilot to the first episode, they changed yeah. the casting and put Tony Robinson in. I think that was a perfect choice. I think he's just the right level of, he looks the part. For one thing, you know, he's not a big guy, he's a little guy. Um, but Tony Robinson is a British actor, um, comedian, and writer. 
television presenter. The other show that you may people may know him from because I think it was on over here was the long-standing archaeological history show Time Team. Yeah. Because he's a passionate lover of history and archaeology, and he fronted the show for many years, which I, I do love it. Um. And um, he he's also. Uh, also quite a political guy in terms of British Labour Party, but he doesn't really, he didn't really translate that into this show. And he's done, all, he's written children's books as well and stuff like that. So he's a, he's a pretty talented guy. So that's the core team that we're in everything. Now there's recurring characters and actors, sometimes recurring actors playing the same character, sometimes different characters. So there's a core other team of actors that are in a lot of it. Um, so the first season, which I wanted to play some clips from, but I've been blocked from doing so by BBC and YouTube. I tried everything, uh, trimming, trimming them right down to the, a sec, you know, just a few seconds here and there. Couldn't get away with it. So, um, so we won't be able to show any clips from that. So we heard of the transgender. Fight. Well, there's there's a lot of um, uh, gender swapping in Blackadder, typically with. Um, People like Percy playing a woman, or George, Lieutenant George, playing a woman. <laughs> they seem to, but the aristocracy, English aristocracy, pretty much enjoyed dressing up. So you know, um, fake breasts, yes. There's all this comedy breasts. Even this show had everything. It had the most broad slapstick and the sharpest, wittiest satire, all in one. It's even in the same scene sometimes. So. Uh, the men's party in season two, yeah, the fake breasts. So, but yeah, the back and forth between Black uh, Blackadder and Baldrick is really at the core of everything because Blackadder often uses Baldrick as his sounding board for some of his more pompous and frustrated his ambitions being frustrated. And, uh, you know, he has to suffer listening to that, and eventually, eventually, um. All right, so there's the one where he wants Blackadder, Baldrick gets Blackadder to stand for Parliament. So he's asking him questions so he can put them on the form. Criminal record? And Baldrick says, absolutely not. Oh, come on, Baldrick, you're going to be an MP for God's sake. I'll just put fraud and sexual deviance. <laughs> <laughs> so that kind of satire and, and, and sharpness is, is just absolutely soaked through this show. So Blackadder, the first season, there was a pilot. The pilot was set in the Elizabethan era, didn't feature Tony Robinson and a lot of the other character, characters. Pilot, I think you might be able to see it somewhere. I've never seen it. Didn't look good. So they decided, the, the BBC, though, being what they were at the time, said, well, you know what, just tweak it a bit and we'll give you a season anyway. Um, did use the same theme music, did keep the central character of Edmund Blackadder. And funnily enough, they took it from the Elizabethan era, which they would revisit in season two and pulled it back in the first real season to the uh, the Middle Ages, more specifically the late 1400s. Um, and they did reuse some of the plot points from the, the um, uh, in the pilot in, in season one. But yeah, it's funny that they had the setting switched around <laughs> and reused it in season two. Um, and yet, according to the book, the pilot played Blackadder like he was in the second season forward, as sharper, wittier, um, not the weasel he became in the first real season. And people, the, the, the critical analysis of the pilot was it was absolutely they got it correct. So why they kind of changed it? To go backwards was you know, they couldn't they weren't quite sure uh, not even the people that wrote it <laughs> <laughs> like why the BBC was a funny thing though at the time as people will know from the Monty Python story you could be really like Monty Python guys they pitched um, they pitched Monty Python's Flying Circus to a producer at the BBC verbally without a single thing to show them or anything written or anything to back it up. And the guy at the BBC said, well, you know, I'm not sure I like the sound of this, so I'm only going to give you 13 episodes. <laughs> it was, 
like you're gonna give us a show on that based on that there's like well, only 13 and if i don't like it then you know so it was the same thing with black Adder. like they went well we don't really like this so we'll give you a season but just one <laughs> you get six episodes six episodes yeah just one season you know so you didn't have to have it didn't have to be great and the bbc then would give you something it was an old boys club i guess they all knew each other so so season one came along set back 100 years from the pilot very different from the other seasons i think i mean i don't know what the chat thinks that they've seen the show actually definitely not one of my favorites it's not my favorite it's the least good of all the show all the seasons yeah um ben elton wasn't involved yet so it was written by atkinson and curtis uh, and I think they tried to make it more of a historical farce than they did a witty satire. But it features um, Blackadder, uh, Atkinson playing the Prince Edmund, the Duke of Edinburgh. He's the son of Richard, Duke of York, who became Richard IV. His uncle is Richard III. So it's set in that era. Battle of Bosworth is about to happen. Brian Blessed, of course, plays his father, which is yeah. <laughs> probably the saving grace of the show, I think. Um, he is attended by Baldrick and also uh, Lord Percy Percy, the Duke of Northumberland, who pretty much play the same characters in the second season. Um, and he's a little bit of, he's hapless, but he's trying to seize the throne for himself. And so he's scheming all the time, scheming to get the throne. Um, Brian Blessed plays his, his fa a father who ascends the throne when in episode one, I think, uh, Edmund kills his uncle by cutting his head off when his uncle's trying to take his horse at the Battle of Bosworth, because he's lacking a horse, he's walking around going, you know, a horse, a kingdom, a kingdom for my horse. And he sees Black Edmund's horse. Edmund's having a piss, meanwhile, in his armor <laughs> behind the tree. And he cuts his head off, and then he realizes he's killed the king. At the same time, he's rescued a, a guy from the battlefield who turns out to be Henry Tudor, their enemy. He doesn't know that at the time, of course. Yeah. So it's got a lot of that farcical element. It's he's trying to put Edmund in the center of that action. Um, Black Baldrick um, introduces something that does stay through a few other seasons, which is his fondness for turnips. Very keen on turnips, which becomes a running gag. Um, so, yeah, Blessed is actually, like he is in Erling, it's, he pretty much plays the same guy he plays in Flash or any of the other things. Yeah. Oh, you know, he's bigger than like blood, death, war, rumpy pumpy, and... Um, you know, he's like a big kid, basically. Didn't really intend to become king. Peter Cook actually plays the uh, British comedy legend. Peter Cook plays Richard III. Um, although he's only, he is in it a bit later as a ghost. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so. And Frank Finlay, who's another British legend uh, actor, a serious actor, actor, plays the witch smeller perceivant in one of the episodes, the one where Edmund's suspected of being a witch. So pretty much, you know, you can see it's uh, it's based on, oh, sorry, based on a lot of farce. Uh, episodes include Edmund becoming Archbishop of Canterbury after accidentally, after his father accidentally gets the Archbishop of Canterbury killed um, by reciting the old um, King Edward the third was it by you know someone rid me of this turbulent priest yeah he's just reciting it as history and somebody here someone actually goes and kills the archbishop they also uh have an episode where edmund is married or is going to get married to um a spanish princess turns out she's a real <laughs> a real porker so he's not too keen on that and so on and so on and eventually he gets thrown out of um thrown out of the court in episode six forms a band of the most evil men in england and comes back to kill the uh, everybody to take over the throne so it's just full of um a lot of farce not so many laughs i didn't find 
I can't really think of many quotable lines from it. I did like the whole sequence where they, in episode six where he has his band of England's most evil men, and one of them is a, a, a person of restricted growth whose name is, yeah, uh, was it James Large? Something like that, yeah. Something like Jack Large, and he says, yeah. well, we yeah. will call you Large Jack, and the guy gets really upset. Why? Well, because you're little. Is that funny to you? You know, so that whole sequence was was kind of well written, I think. Um, and also Comics Division would appreciate it immensely. Uh, yeah, so there's a lot of great actors in, in um, yeah, Turnip Shaped Like a Thingy, which is one <laughs> well, looks a Turnip Shaped Like a Thingy. Um, but yeah, it makes, it does use um, the absurdity of the violence at the time. There's a lot of people getting their heads cut off in the show, getting poisoned, a lot of uh, machinations. The whole Witchfinder thing is like, it, it, it features that um, thing that if, if you're found, if you're, I think it was, is, it goes, if you, if, if you, if you're not guilty, if you're guilty, We'll be, you'll be beheaded. We'll ring the axe down your head. If you're guilty, your head will be cut off. If you're not guilty, the axe will bounce off your head, but then you'll be burnt to death. So you've yeah. got no way out either. <laughs> How can oh, there's win? some uh, viable choices I've ever heard. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Well, they used to tie witches up and throw them in the water, and it's like if you swim, you're a witch. If you don't, if, if you drown, you're 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 innocent. Yeah. That's right. That's that's the whole thing. And Monty Python spoofed that quite well as well. But um, so there's a great show called British Comedy Guide, which does feature snippets of each episode. The Witch Miller one is um, the Witch Smeller, though he smells them because there's a, a spate of plagues. They suspect Edmund of doing it and the sorcery and whatever. Um, I can't remember how he gets out of it though, but he does. The Queen of Spain's beard is uh, Maria Margoyles plays the part of the princess and she's the Spanish Infanta. But he's horrified. And anyway. Yeah. It's um but they broadcast as this this guide mentions, they actually broadcast them out of sequence on the at the time. They broadcast episode four as two and two as four, even though chronologically it made no, no sense because they weren't quite finished episode two. So I don't think it makes a great deal of difference, but it did make the plot such as it was even more nonsensical. So, but yeah, Davina, the, the plot um, doesn't make a lot of sense to maybe a lot of non-English people because it's very focused on English history and all those kings and nobles and courtier, courtiers and courtiers and um but yeah, Blackadder gets a prophecy that says he'll be king. He spends his time plotting to overthrow them. He ends up killing everyone in the court, including himself. So he gets to be king for 30 seconds. Somewhere in amongst all that, he fathers an illegitimate child, which is very important. You don't know about that until later seasons, of course. Otherwise, there would be no Blackadders in the future. Very expensive to make. A lot of film, on-location filming, uh, only got like a couple of million viewers per episode. The BBC said, well, you know what? We'll let you do another one, but you've got to cut the costs drastically and you've really got to sharpen up the script. Uh, same theme music, though. They kept the theme music. So, yeah, so the BBC didn't say cancelled. They said, well, we'll let you have one more. <laughs> we think you can do better, you know. So very forgiving. And luckily, they then hired Ben Elton to help with the script, which made a massive difference. And they decided to go back to two or three indoor sets, small number of characters, uh, cut the cost drastically. And I think it helped because it made it much more intimate. Then the 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 on location stuff just didn't. It might have looked great, but it was wasn't funny in the slightest. You know, yeah. very broad. So that was season one. Season two, of course things got drastically better. So I do actually happen to have a great painstaking effort, some small clips from season two that were not banned or blocked by YouTube and the BBC. So I'm going to play a little bit of that. Not the best ones that I wanted, but it's still a flavor of season two. If I have two beans and then I add two more beans, what do I have? Some beans. Thanks, 
bridesmaid like the beard. <laughs> Gives me something to hang on to. I'll wager it ne'er felt the lash of the cat. Been rubbed with salt and then flayed off by a pirate chief to make fine stockings for his best cabin boy. Oh, God. This place stinks like a pair of armoured trousers after the Hundred Years' War. <laughs> Of course, you know what your great discovery means, don't you, Percy? Perhaps, my lord. That you, Percy, Lord Percy, are an utter book. <laughs> aye, aye, sir. Never, ever try to be funny in my presence again, Percy. <laughs> oh, well, that's no good, is it? Because when I throw things away, I don't want them to come back. Yeah, yeah so... Uh... Just a tiny snippet. That whole, so there's some, some really key sequences there. First of all, you got um, Blackadder trying to teach Baldrick how to count, which is just yeah. It's three minutes of pure agony. <laughs> so you've got two beans and another two beans. What have I got now? Well, you've got three beans and one more. <laughs> he just refuses to get. It. What have I got now? Small casserole. <laughs> It's funny. It's hilarious. Uh, Jacob Nairn says he's here. Good to see you, Jacob. Um, so Blackadder 2, immediate improvement in quality. Six episodes set in the Elizabethan era with Queen Elizabeth I, Lizzie. Um, yeah. With uh, Edmund Blackadder is no longer an heir to the throne. He's not part of it. He's in the court. He's Lord Edmund Blackadder a descendant of the first Blackadder. Apparently, one of his forebearers between the two was Cardinal Blackadder, who was the keepy, keeper of the privy rolls. In other words, the toilet paper of the yeah. court, and therefore was close to the seat of power, was the way they put it in the book. <laughs> Um, and descendants of Baldrick and Percy continue to be his sidekicks. Um, he's much more suave and sophisticated in this, uh, but he's equally failure prone in his attempts to navigate the court of Queen Elizabeth I, particularly as he's trying to get close to the Queen to perhaps become her suitor and then become king one day. Um, Baldrick and Percy are still pretty dumb and hapless. But they introduce some new main characters. There's Lord Melchett, who's Blackadder's rival for Elizabeth's affections and, and power and approval in the court, played by Stephen Fry. Um, Fry is uh, a longtime friend of Hugh Laurie, and prefer with so who we're going to cover in that soon. But uh, also introduced Nursey, who's actually a real character in real life. There was a Nursey. Elizabeth I had a long time nurse from her infancy onwards. Um, and she's played by Patsy Byrne, and she's a bit weird, disturbing almost, I would say. Uh, and also introduces Lord Flashheart, played by Rick Mail, who just absolutely wipes the floor when he comes on in any scene in, in any yep. of the seasons. Lots of cunning, cunning plans, yeah. Um, so Stephen Fry is a uh, long-time collaborator. He's an actor, a writer, long-time collaborator with future Black Adder star Hugh Laurie. They did a show called Little Bit F Fry and Laurie. Uh, they did Jeeves and Wooster, which was a big, quite a big success. I think they might have shown that in PBS as well. This is when Hugh Laurie, before he became, of course, House, yeah. and he was a bit of a comedic guy. So long-time friends, they've done a lot of things together, still talking about reunion stuff now. Uh, very popular and very upper class, so, you know, university types, whatever. Um, the Queen was played by um, Miranda Richardson, and she plays her like a little girl. Maybe a psychotic, excitable little girl, but a little, yeah. <laughs> little girl nonetheless, all the squealing and whatever. And, but her whims rule the court, such as when she's into explorers. So Edmund has to go get a ship and become an explorer. That's where you see Tom Baker there as the Captain Redbeard Rum, who's yep. also a very weird character. 
Uh, Patsy Byrne plays Nursey, and she's got some really, she's a really weird type. Um, and then Rick Mail, of course, has introduced his flash art. He was one of the writers and creators of um, The Young Ones, and also did a lot of other great shows that somebody mentioned that bought them earlier. New Statesman, uh, Dashing. Um, you know, he's he's not the, how could I put it? Flash Art's very dashing, but a lot of his other characters are not. He plays yeah. in other things. Uh, Flash Art's beyond dashing. He's like the ultimate sexist uh, man. He's the ultimate alpha. Yeah. He also had a, a film called Drop Dead Fred, which um, wasn't a huge hit, but was released in America, I think. It was his, their, his, their attempt to make him a star. My sister loved that movie for some reason. Yeah. I don't know why. Yeah, it was okay, but nothing great. Yeah. Um, I liked the character he played in the, the show Bottom, which I don't have an image of. He played Eddie Hitler in Bottom, which is another great tradition of British comedy is naming people Hitler or <laughs> naming them after Hitler. Um, and then Tom Baker had a one-off, uh, obviously, as um, Captain Redbeard Rum, who is a, an obsession with... Like, he says to Blackheart, you have the skin of a woman. That's the scene. <laughs> you have the hands of a woman, sir. Oh, look, you have the legs of a woman. <laughs> and he takes Blackadder. They go on the ship, and apparently they discover Australia 200 years before it was actually discovered. That's why the boomerang in, the, in that yeah. clip. So. Um, oh, sorry, not going into the third yet. So Blackadder the second... Uh, I mean, there's endlessly quotable stuff in it, I'm sure, which I, I, I would have to look through all of these. You skipped over Bob. Oh, Bob, yes. Well, Bob is in... So so episode... We can go through the episodes of this. So in episode one, uh, called Bells, each of the episodes has a single word name, he hits a manservant called Bob, and he finds himself disturbed that he's falling in love with Bob. What's your name, boy? Kate. Isn't that a girl's name? It's uh, short for uh, Bob. Because <laughs> she wants to get a, women can't get jobs doing stuff. And yeah. To get a job. Um, so he falls in love with his manservant, but luckily it turns out she's really a girl in disguise for him. Uh, and they're going to get married, and that's when Flashheart turns up and because uh, he's, he's going to be the best man. Well, Percy is because Flashheart doesn't turn, isn't there, and he's Edmund's old buddy. And he turns up and headbutts Percy, um, and then steals his <laughs> steals his woman, as well as charming uh, everybody else. Well, that's when he makes the canoe line. He goes up to Nursey yeah. and says, "Am I excited to see you? Or I just have a canoe in my pocket?" <laughs> and then, push, he's off. So that's. Um, but you can see that it, one kind of other uh, sort of. I just show this on the stream. Um, he starts to look quite handsome uh, in these, you know. He's not unattractive there, but Bob is also strangely not unattractive. Yeah. <laughs> and she does this, oh boy, you know, a boy thing. He's like, oh God, you know. <laughs> he just, in the end, he gives into it, you know. Oh, well, it is what it is. Yeah. It turns out she is a girl. Second episode, uh, he is promoted to Lord High Executioner uh, for some reason, and he accidentally executes Sir Francis Drake. <laughs> and then he also, because um, he... When you see him in the big book of the dead at the beginning, that's when he's saying, oh, we're going to, we should, we, and, and Percy says, oh, so Edmund uh, Francis Drake, well, that'll draw a big crowd, sailing enthusiasts, and he's got a souvenir stall. He says, we better put some anchors on that so we make some money. But anyway, he goes to see Edmund Drake's wife and, and whatever, and it all becomes quite um, fraught because he executes Drake out of turn. He was meant to do it on Thursday. He says, well, let's bring him up to Tuesday. And then he has to pretend he hasn't executed him. So he has to pretend to his wife that he hasn't executed him. And then he, the Queen wants to see him. And he's at one point, he's got Drake's head behind his back in the hall of the head. He's hiding it behind the back. But um, 
Uh, it's yeah. I don't. And again, I can't remember how he gets out of it, but it's absolutely not the role that he wanted to be promoted to buyer. No. Nah. Uh, Potato is the one where Walter Raleigh. Um, again, the history is a bit out of touch here because Walter Raleigh, I think, came back seven years before Elizabeth I was born and he didn't bring potatoes. It's called potato. He brought tobacco. Potatoes didn't come till much later. Yeah. But anyway, the Queen falls in love with him because of all his explorer stories. And then, um, <laughs> as it says here, Edmund wants to get one over on this smug git. So he becomes an explorer himself. And um, it finds Australia and New Zealand. Yeah. To you, it's a potato. To me, yeah. it's a potato. Yeah. To Sir Walter Bloody Riley, it's fine characters, a luxury estate, and as many girls as his tongue can cope with. He's making a fortune <laughs> out of these things. People are smoking them, building houses out of them. They'll be eating them next. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> this potato is everything to them. Yeah. Uh, Hang on. What was the leeches one? That was in season two. They talked about leech farms. Oh, was this one? No, this is was this the one where he tries to get a cure for being gay by using leeches? In the in the the one with Bob. Yeah. I, I've never had anything you doctors didn't try to cure with leeches because the first thing he says, I bet I know what you're going to sub, you're going to prescribe leeches. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Oh, yeah, there's another line. Was it, leave me alone, Baldrick. If I'd wanted to talk to a vegetable, I would have bought one at the market. Mm -hmm. So potato and then uh, money. So money is where they have to prostitute. <laughs> they prostitute Baldrick for cash because um, Baldrick is in uh, debt to the bishop-eating baby of Bath and Wells. Um, and they send... Yeah, they get a red hot poker up the ass if they, uh, if he doesn't pay. So the send Baldrick out. I think he makes three hundred pounds and a shilling, and he says, "How many? Where did you get the shilling from? All of them." You know, there's that kind of joke. <laughs> but yeah, he goes down the docks to make some cash. So it's just you know, uh, beer is. This is the one with the party with the boys party and the fight fake breasts uh, on the head and whatever. There's turnips involved in this one too. Uh, and his aunt, is it, this is the one, his aunt, his God-fearing aunt appears, Lady Blackadder. And when he has to describe to her, it's one of the scenes I wanted to clip where she asks about toilets and he describes it as yeah, this is an outwardly facing open air, blah, 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 blah. And she goes, you mean you crap out of the window? And he goes, yes. She says, thank God, I hate those smelly indoor things. <laughs> <laughs> so you think you think she's going to be pissed off about this because she's so God-fearing, you know? Um, I mean, it's just an embarrassing set of circumstances, but... But yeah, the final episode is where it takes a really weird turn. So chains. So they're taken hostage by the German Prince Ludwig, who apparently has been playing Queen Elizabeth I in drag for 40 years anyway. As is revealed at the very end of the show, she is actually Prince Ludwig. So his elaborate 40-year plan to get the throne of England seems to work. <laughs> and again... Like the first series, everyone in the court is murdered at the end by Ludwig. Yeah. Um, Who's played by? Isn't that... Um, Hugh Laurie. Hugh Laurie, yes. He plays. He makes his first appearance playing yep. Prince Ludwig, yeah. Uh, now, I'd love to have shown more clips from these, but uh, as I say, they all got blocked. But it's, it's when the series really turned into... Not just a farce, but some witty, witty one-liners, some brilliant insults. Milchit is always getting insulted by Blackadder. Um, he's always insulting Percy. Percy invents Greek gold, because obviously alchemy was all the rage, but it turns out to be green. Ivan Lim did a lump of purest green. 
<laughs> the whole thing is just farcical. Um, so he's madder than mad, Jack McMad, the winner of last year's Mr. Madman competition. It's just full of stuff like that. Uh, great show. Oh, flash art. Enter the man who has no underwear. Ask me why. Why do you have no underwear, Lord Flash? Because the pants haven't been built yet that will take the job on. That might have been in season four. I don't know. And uh, when he says to Black, like, <laughs> Baldrick, Black Baldrick, believe me, eternity in the company of Beelzebub and all his hellish instruments of death will be a picnic compared to five minutes with me and this pencil. <laughs> So Blackadder 2 was huge improvement, big success, started to get five or six million viewers per week. Um, oh, Courtney, hey, good to see you last. We did play your video earlier. Everyone loved it. Brilliant stuff. Uh, Money is also a famous Martin Amos novel and Opportunities was Money the... Um, I know there's an episode of it called Money in here, but I think it's a yeah. Let's Make Lots of Money, Pet Shop Boys, yeah. I do remember that song. Wicked Child. Lady White Adder, yes. She was uh these are all brilliant episodes. Wish we could show you bits of them. But I yep. showed all that I was able to get away with. Which is a shame. It is a shame, yeah. Hope you're all enjoying this though. And yeah, keep the, the quotes coming. We need more of the quotes. Confess, I love the devil and you cut off my ghoulies with a scythe. <laughs> so season two sealed the deal. They were going to get more because it was a big success. Very funny. And that restricted just having two or three sets and whatever worked really well. Uh, so on to season three. And I do have, luckily, a little bit of small amount of clips from season three and by an extraordinary stroke of luck it is a rotten borough really is it well lucky lucky us <laughs> you don't know what a rotten borough is do you sir? <laughs> no the encyclopedic implementation of my premeditated orchestration of demotic anglo-saxon <laughs> nope, didn't catch any of that. Doctor is trying to tell you that he is happy because he has finished his book. It has apparently taken him ten years. Yes, well, I'm a slow reader myself. <laughs> oh, joy! Then come, Prince Cuddly Kitten. Climb up my ivy. Sausage time! <laughs> no, 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 we did this robbery together, so you get half the cash. Oh, thank you, Mr. B. This robbery, on the other hand, I'm doing alone. Hand it over, your money or your life. <laughs> and what do we have for royalty? A mad kraut sausage sucker and a son who can't keep his own sausage to himself. <laughs> Get up! Oh, Christ, yes, I forgot. I forgot. You speak when you're spoken to! <laughs> Unless you'd rather be flayed across a gun carriage? Well, <laughs> I'll tell you why. That's because there's no coffee shop in England big enough for two black adders. <laughs> Ah, uh, Clan McAdder making an appearance at last. <laughs> Clan McAdder. Not Wee Jock Moo Mac Poo McPlop, which is a different one, of course. But, um, so, yeah, Blackadder III, 1987, setting jumps forward to the Regency era of King George III. Blackadder's now a butler to the Prince Regent. He's fallen a little bit further. He's no longer nobility, even. He's now a butler. Still in with the court, though, because of that. Um, George III, Prince, uh, George, Prince Regent, of course, Prince George, son of the mad King George III, who does make an appearance later. And I believe he marries Blackadder to a rosebush at that point. Um, so Blackadder is still in as the secretary, come cook, come odd job man, whatever, man about, odd job man about the Prince Regent's house. There's no Percy, no Lord Percy in this. Um, the show really hit its stride by now. Very funny, huge success. It introduces the um, deeply hedonistic, but also deeply stupid Prince Regent, played by 
Stephen Fry's buddy Hugh Laurie. We can see Hugh Lo uh, Stephen Fry is still in the show in one episode as uh, the Duke of Wellington, which again doesn't match the real history timeline. <laughs> terms, who cares? You know, that's um, close enough. Also, the Duke of Wellington episode where he's 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 there to to confront the Prince George for um, basically ruining his two daughters <laughs> um, and offering him a duel. Wellington was against duels in real life. He was bitterly against them. He didn't believe them. I do like the choice of weapon he chose in this one, though, for the duel. Four-inch cannonades, you know. Yep. <laughs> Firing cannons at each other. Um, so, yeah, Hugh Laurie makes an entrance. Uh, obviously, he was in the shows earlier with Stephen Fry and then, of course, went on after this to be in House, playing a radically different character from the Prince Regent. Um, as different as you could possibly get and then became a huge star in America of course, I don't think people even equate the two guys together when they see this guy and then Prince yeah. Regent um, so Stephen Fry uh, makes a guest appearance as Wellington what are the name of Bonaparte's balls is this fellow doing now but the funny thing is of course in that episode is that Blackadder and the prince switch places so that Black Oops Blackadder can protect the prince because the prince has got no chance against Wellington. Yeah. Um, and then of course that leads Wellington to slap the prince around a lot, thinking he's just a rude servant. And then he goes, uh, so so he's he's sitting down talking strategy about the war against Napoleon. And he's going, ah, ah. so Blackadder suggests things to him about it. And he goes, I heard you were a complete imbecile. You know, it turns out you're not. It's still a pity I'm going to have to kill you because of my daughters or whatever. But, so at one point, Blackadder suggests, um, she says, we stationed our Navy up in Alaska, which didn't exist then, of course. There was no such place as Alaska. It was a Russian yeah. province. We stationed it so that in case Napoleon tries to come over the Arctic to to surprise us. He says, well, that does, why don't you just attack Napoleon's Navy and midships, maybe at this place called Trafalgar? So he actually, Blackadder makes an impact on real life history in that one. But then later on, um, when when Blackadder, as the Reed Prince Regent, survives the cannon shot because of a cigarette case, yeah. the Regent turns up and says, I'm actually the Prince Napoleon. Uh, Wellington kills him for being, for being. Uh, you know, how dare you claim you're the prince and kills him, making Black Arrow the real prince and the real heir to the throne. Um, by some weird coincidence, so King Anyways, George isn't going to acknowledge that because he's completely loony. Well, he's loony. You know, so he comes in and marries him to a rosebush and whatever. And, um, so Black Arrow ends up being the, th the heir to the throne in the future, George the Fourth. Probably. Yeah. Um, so another brilliant one-off in this uh, one-off role is is Robbie Coltrane, the great Scottish comedian, also sadly passed away last year, I think. Yeah. If you haven't seen him in anything else, uh, those in North America are not too aware of him. He was in the Harry Potter movies as Hagrid, but long, long-standing career as a British comedian and uh, a writer. He plays Dr. Samuel Johnson in one of the episodes where he's writing his 10-year project to write the dictionary, the English dictionary. Now, again, they're playing with the timeline because Dr. Johnson actually published his dictionary seven years before Prince Regent George was born, but never mind. But he's visiting here to, to get the Prince, Regent, Prince Regent's um, patronage to publish yeah. this dictionary which has taken him 10 years to collect every word in the English language. I mean, I love the bit where he says, I, I, my wife was serviced by legions of lovers. I care not, you know, whatever. My children all starve to death. <laughs> He's obsessed with this dictionary. But this whole scene is brilliant because, first of all, the prince is a complete dummy. So when you see him in the clip at the beginning describing what the book's about, he goes, what? It's a description of our tongue, Norman tongue, our time since Norman tongue, where he goes, oh, I love a bit of Norman tongue, you know. 
because he's such a dummy. But Blackadder really doesn't like this guy. Because Blackadder's no. a bit of a smart, he thinks he's quite smart and a writer as well. And he goes, um, this whole sequence is about I've got every single word in there. And Blackadder's going, every word? He goes, yes, every word in the English language. He says, well, in that case, I offer my enthusiastic contrafibulations to you. What? <laughs> he goes, oh, it's a common word around our parts. So he's seriously <laughs> writing it down. And then he goes on to, I'm sorry, sir. I'm antiseptic, phrasmotic, even compunctious to have caused you such pericombulation. And he's like, fuck, I've missed all these words. <laughs> I think at the end he finds out he's missed the word sausage <laughs> as well because sausage. Black Baldrick keeps talking about sausages in this episode. Yeah. So John is brilliant. Robbie Coltrane's brilliant. In it. But the whole episode revolves around, and spoiler alerts here through all this, revolves around the think they've accidentally burnt his dictionary that he's got no copies of. It's one copy. And Baldrick lights a fire with what we think is the dictionary. So they they spend a whole night trying to write the dictionary, the three of them, the prince and him and Baldrick. I think they get as far as Aardvark. Yeah. <laughs> and then at the end, they discover they haven't burnt it. It's something else they burnt. So, well, that's okay then. We're fine. And, you know, Johnson doesn't kill them. But at the end, Baldrick's so stupid, he throws that one on the fire again <laughs> and actually burns it this time. So. It's just one of the greatest episodes of TV ever. It's got everything. It's got wit, it's got verbal comedy, and it's got some brilliant farce in it and slapstick. Yep. Brilliant episode. So Robbie Coltrane, rest in peace, sir. And and then um, but Tim, Tim McKinnery, of course, um, may not be playing Percy anymore, but he does make an affair, appearance as the Comte de Frou-Frou, who I think is actually the Scarlet Pimpernel. Because there's a whole episode about the French Revolution and the Scarlet Pimpernel and Black Arrow gets dragooned and going over to try and rescue this guy and blah, blah, blah. And turns out McHenry's playing a hapless French guy, but he's really a hero. But they all yeah. end up getting killed by Black Adder accidentally anyway, so, you know. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to ever be too close to Black Adder, you're going to no. die. That's right. He kills the good guys, never mind the bad guys. And there's a couple of good episode, uh, good appearances. Nigel Planer, who was in The Young Ones, is in this episode too, uh, as the French jailer, who's like totally yeah. over the top with it. I think he's the French jailer, or am I getting mixed up? No, Nigel Planer is the other guy that's working with the, the Scarlet Pimpernel, who gets killed by Blackadder. So there's two good guys. The yeah. the um, the guy that's playing the jailer is uh, the guy that was in Red Dwarf. What's his name? Uh, the not not the guy is the holograph. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> my I mind just, has just come blank. <laughs> so he's he's in it. He's the French jailer. Yeah. Shit, what's his name? I'm looking him up. Somebody will tell me. That's another Chris series Barry. I Chris, know nothing about. Yeah, Chris than... Barry was in is in this episode briefly. Uh, so there's a few few cameos. But it's nice to see Tim McHenry getting a, a part, and of course he gets a part, and in, in Black Arrow goes forth too. So they don't, even though the character his character isn't in it, he's still. Um, I was just a bit, I was trying to rub that black spot off on the screen. It's a mole. You mean? Um, oops. You don't mean Norman Lovett, do you? Norman Lovett? No, I mean Chris Barry. Okay, yeah, that's right. Chris Barry's he, in, in it as the French dealer. When you said Holly, I was thinking hologram. Oh, I was thinking oh, Holly. No, I was thinking hologram as opposed to Holly. Yeah, yeah. Because Chris Barry's a hologram too, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. We're going to do Red Dwarf one of these days. Uh, so, some great, uh, I mean, even more of a success this show. You know, it got like seven or eight million views. The views steadily rise as each season and each show goes on. Um, so that first episode is where you see um, the Prince Regent playing host to an old MP who's looking for some support and he dies in front of him because he's so old and fat. And that's when the whole rotten borough thing comes in that sequence i managed to clip two little bits three little bits of it it goes on for about a minute because 
the prince has no idea what a rotten borough it is. And it's basically a, you know, a rotten, um, like it's got like a, the voter, a couple of voters who are under the control of the you know, the MP or the Lord that runs the place. It's just like they, they got rid of these years ago, but they're no voters hardly. It's like, like one guy and his cat, you know. So they were easily bought. You could buy those to get an MP. So William Pitt the Younger is trying to bankrupt the prince. So the prince needs support. And this is why when that guy dies, they put Baldrick up to be the MP. One of the jokes in this is that William Pitt the Younger is obviously there's a William Pitt the Elder because these were real politicians in Britain and, 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 and back in the day. So when Blackadder's talking to the guy, he's like 14, he says, what's next? Is it going to be William Pitt the fetus? Or, you know, <laughs> William Pitt the twinkling in your father's eye? He's rubber button. <laughs> That's right. The prince thinks it's rubber button. <laughs> you turn the ambassador into pate. That's the French deal. Yeah. Mm, pate. He's hung like a baby carrot. Yeah. Davina's giving us the history here. She's hitting us with the history, so so we're going to highlight that. Oh, I wasn't even I wasn't even paying attention to the chat. Yeah, I've been looking at it. I just haven't had time to highlight too much of it. But uh, the term rotten borough came into use in the 18th century. It meant a parliamentary borough with a tiny electorate so small that voters were susceptible to control in a variety of ways, like either bribery or we'll throw you out of your house if you don't vote for me. Oh yeah, the the shame of a hot steaming crumpet burning between my cheeks. That's a line out of Blackadder Goes Forth with um, Lieutenant George. Yeah. yeah. These are the lines we want. Keep them coming. Rubber button. That whole rubber button thing's hilarious. Um, he's hung like a baby carrot. Yeah. Um, but yeah, William Pitt, the, the fetus or whatever it is. He says embryo. That's it. Pitt the embryo. Um. So inking and capability is the the episode with Dr. Johnson, and it just. But the funny thing is, they put again history wise. They've put Samuel Johnson in a room with Keats, and other poets who weren't around. It's, it's, as somebody said in the book, it's like putting H.G. Uh, Wells out there with the Beatles uh, crossing Abbey Road. None of them were around at exactly the same time. You know? The opium fiend actors. Uh, Nob and Nobility, the Scarlet Pimpernel, yeah. Garlic, <laughs> objectionable garlic munchers. <laughs> yeah, and Blackadder thinks, because okay, the Pimpernel's all their age and, and everyone thinks he's great, so Blackadder hates it naturally because he hates anybody that's popular like that. Yeah. And he thinks they're overrated. Uh, sense and Senility was the, uh, oh, they went about the anarchist movement. Yeah, the two thespians. This has got a running gag in it. With uh, he, he, he gets um, acting lessons for the prince. He try he wants these two famous actors to give him lessons. So Blackadder, what drives him crazy because he hates them because they're pretentious. Gets by saying Macbeth all the time, and every time they say Macbeth, they have to do this routine where they hate each other and whatever to pay a tone for it because you're not allowed to say the. Scottish play out loud and he just keeps getting them to say Macbeth all the time and he says he forces them to do it by trickery um, will his trousers stand the strain this is I think this is the one where he is you know lots of jokes about his trousers was it I'm as happy as a Frenchman with a new pair of trousers or a pair of expanding trousers or something oh yeah that's, that's another line uh, from it. sex is like socks tons of it about but I keep missing Missing one. <laughs> <laughs> MP Baldrick and his turn up, yeah. It's just the jokes are, are absolutely coming thick and fast by this time. Um honestly, I watched a few of these again leading up to this to try and get clips from them. And I was hurting myself laughing. Um and I wish I could um I lost closer friends than Darling Georgie the last time I was deloused. <laughs> that's but from that, uh, Black Adder Goes Forth, isn't it? That's Black Adder Goes Forth. The path of my yeah. life is strewn with cowpats from the devil's own satanic yep. bird. <laughs> I, 
Baldrick, I want you to take this. I think this might be from the, the special, the Blackadder Christmas special. Baldrick, I want you to take this and go out and buy a turkey so large you think its mother had been rogered by an omnibus. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I love the subtle plans are here again one that you said earlier. <laughs> yeah. You've really worked this out. You're, you really worked out your banter, haven't you? But Blackadder says, no, this is a different thing. It's spontaneous and it's called wit. So he's great with the put downs, you know. Um, anyway, in the last episode, um, so the last two episodes, Amy and Amy Ability is the one where the prince is bankrupt and he's trying to woo Miranda Richardson as um, Amy Hardwood and um, that's a sausage time. <laughs> she comes out on the, on the balcony and he goes, woof! He's copying Flash Heart, of course. Um, he wants a light, fluffy bunny of a girl and the whole thing is that she's all fluffy, wuffy, oh, princey, wincy. It turns out she's not really like that in the end. Um, and then Jewel and Duality, which is the whole. This is the one where Jock, Mc... Jock McAdder is in it, in the Mrs. Miggins pie shop, which is in every episode too. Mrs. Miggins yeah. in her pie shop, and he's supposed to be coming there to fight the duel on Blackadder's behalf. But then he falls in love with Mrs. Miggins, and they run off back to Scotland. Um, wetter than a haddock's bathing costume. <laughs> Thick and fast, it says, uh, you know it, two things women have never said to me. Um, but Blackadder's insults, yeah, if you've got them, keep them coming. But, um, the the last one is fantastic with the whole, is it the prince? He's not the prince, but he is the prince, but he isn't the prince. Yeah. The prince then appears at the end and he's shot by, because the Wellington shoots him with the cannon because he's, he's disgusted with the guy continuing to pretend he's the prince, even though he is the prince. And Baldrick's cradling him in his arms and he goes, it's okay, I have a cigarette case too that saved me. Oh shit, I left it at home. And then he dies. <laughs> it's just, uh, it's, it's such good fun. Great, se great season, absolutely uh, brilliant stuff. Can't right. wait early enough. Now oh. Here's the plan. When he offers me swords, kick him in the nuts and you set fire to the building and the confusion <laughs> will claim a draw. That's right. That's the plan. But yeah, I love it when Wellington chooses cannons to fight with, not just pistols. And uh, Stephen Fry plays it so over the top as well. Like Wellington's just this brutal whatever. It's absolutely determined to get revenge on the prince for rogering his daughters with him. So... That season was such a good hit. There's, they're just they're on a roll. They're going to keep it going. Uh, then we come to possibly one of the finest television shows ever made. Certainly finest comedies ever made. Blackadder goes forth. They take the leap forward to the First World War. Um, and I, I mean, there have been many comedies set during wartime. And they've always got that balance they have to find between talking about either they ignore the like Hogan's heroes and others, they maybe ignore the the, the brutal realities of the thing, um, or Allo Allo, or any of these other sitcoms where they 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 kind of shy away from some of the stuff. Now this one, obviously, they didn't set this in World War Two, which would have brought its own issues, but it's set. Um, Set in World War One, I, I guess. So they can, yeah. whilst they can poke fun at the Germans, there's none of the the Yahtzee stuff that they have to deal with per se. Although they do poke fun mercilessly at the Germans in this uh, Teutonic, uh, their oh, Teutonic the, the stuff. Huns. Oh, that's a joke, by the way. That in Backadder, the third was uh, when the prince storms out the room and says, "Oh, oh no!" So the dictionary. Oh God, say, of course we can do this in one night. We're English. And he leaves the room and the print and Blackadder goes, You're not your German. Because <laughs> they were the Habsburgs. Um Zach's is here. Hey buddy, how are you? 
So as Davina says, trench warfare, this is set in the trenches in 1916-17 in the Somme, I think it's meant to be. And they don't shy away from that. Um, again, they never lose the comedy. It's an incredible balance there between the comedy and pointing out the absurdity and the horror of the whole thing, and particularly the, the, the ending, which we will talk about soon. Um, but anyway, they managed to make fun and poke fun at the whole thing without without ever disrespecting the people that were there or lost their lives. So, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. This whenever Blackadder and the crew get pulled back from the front to headquarters to talk to General Melch at the mood lines of it all. Yeah, and funnily enough, when they were making this, it was pitched as it would be literally three guys and a couple of guests in the trench setting the whole time. And then when they came to film the thing, Rowan Atkinson said, well, wait a minute, we're in headquarters, we're in a hospital at one point, we're doing this, we're doing that. It actually expanded a little bit from the original premise, which was literally a three-hander in one set. Um, but yeah, so the... the, the uh, oh, hang on. The one about the spies, somebody mentioned, yeah. Doing a hex. Have you seen any spies? Nine. <laughs> So we'll get to that episode in a minute, but um, yeah. So your dad is a German. You married a German. <laughs> this is the, the Prince Regent. So back in 1989, they made Blackadder goes forth. It's set in the trenches of World War One. Um, Edmund Blackadder is now a captain in the British Army. So he's certainly a gentleman. He's not nobility, but he is a, a an officer. Um, he has a past as well, as we find out in the show that he fought in the. Um, Battle of um, what was it called? Mobutu Gorge, the Battle of Mobutu Gorge in the Sudan, where he saves uh, Dougie Earl Haig um, from a vicious mango that was about to kill. <laughs> they get some field head. marshal Haig. If now field marshal Haig, it was just Dougie Haig back then. Yeah. Um, apparently his friends did call him Dougie, so that part was real. And actually there's there's some historical, of all the shows, it perhaps sticks more to historical veracity in it because it's the First World War and its portrayal of the buffoonery of the of officers, of the callousness of Haig and so on. It, it sticks a little bit more to that than, than some of the other shows. Um, but yeah, and he also apparently fought in in the Battle of Rourke's Drift, where uh, he's heard to see, this is in, in this is not seen on screen, but it's in the stuff that was written about the background of the character, where he says at the end, uh, "Okay, to the Zulus, okay, you can keep the bloody place then if you want it that much." So, <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, so the whole spy one is brilliant. So, because. <laughs> When he when he says um, when he's joking, you know, do you mean the plan to kill everyone with General Haig, his wife, and his pet turtle? My God, even you know the plan because it's so stupid, you know. So anyway, um, Blackadder uh, is the captain. Baldrick is his Batman, as they called them. So he looks after the captain, gets him cups of tea, cups of coffee, which are made from questionable materials. Um, which Mike is always is fun. Feels. That's right. It's just fun when Captain Darling appears and they offer him a cup of coffee and you hear Baldrick going <sighs> behind the curtain and he goes, oh, cappuccino. <laughs> Have you got any of those little brown sprinkles? <laughs> Baldrick's about to go get some and he goes, no, that's going too far. Stop it. <laughs> so Baldrick uh, is the Batman. Hugh Laurie again is in it, but this is a great picture of Baldrick in the gear. In all the gear, it's a brilliant uh, costume there. Brilliant, uh, and and, and key, in keeping with all of Baldrick through history, he's yeah. he's slovenly and he's got his uniforms all ragged and dirty. Yeah, and totally. he actually has an excuse for it this time though because he is in the trenches. So yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, so Hugh Laurie plays, and this is this is a good one. He plays Lieutenant the Honourable George Colehurst. St. John Burley is his full name. Um, but just Lieutenant George normally. Um, and then Stephen Fry is in a 
permanent role again, as opposed to just his guest and role in season three of their commanding officer back at HQ, General Sir Anthony Cecil Hogmany Melchett. Nah, nah, and the the tash. <laughs> come for a trim, just a little trim of the tash this time. The mustache. Uh, he's back at HQ. He's the buffoon of a commanding officer, but he's also back there. Is um, Tim McHenry back as a, a in a role, a permanent role in the show as Melchett's adjutant, Captain Darling, which is used to great effect throughout the entire show. The fact that he's called Captain Darling. <laughs> How do I look, Darling? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, Darling. <laughs> it's just. I mean, it's an obvious and stupid joke, but there it is. <laughs> oh, yeah, this is this. Uh, I mean, the, the spy episode has just got some of the wittiest stuff ever. Um, when he when he uh, when he accuses the nurse, Nurse Mary, of being the German spy, even though he's just slept with her. Yeah, when I asked you if you'd heard of the three great British universities, you failed to identify which one was not, which was not one of them. Yes, because he said Oxford, Cambridge, and Hull, and Meltzer says, "Yes, Oxford is a dump. <laughs> it's a, Hull is one of the great universities. Oxford's a dump. <laughs> the poor woman, because there's all these people there. They suspect there's the the guy that's obviously a German in the bed, but it turns out he's a British spy who's injured. But he's that's why he sounds like a German. It's so funny that." Um, oh yeah, the the whole th there's another running gag throughout the show about because it's so futile being in the trenches. And he's looking at the map. We've captured more territory. How much? <laughs> Just an inch. <laughs> this map is one to one scale. There hasn't been a war run this badly since Olaf the Hairy, king of all the Vikings, ordered eighty thousand battle helmets with the horns on the, the horns inside. inside. Yeah. <laughs> If you and were then, to serve one of your meals at Staff HQ, you'd be arrested for the greatest mass poisoning since Lucretia Borgia invited 500 of her close friends for a wine and anthrax party. <laughs> That's right. Uh, Field Marshal Haig is about to make yet another gargantuan effort to move his drinks cabinet six inches closer to Berlin. Yeah. yeah anyway. Um, Tim McHenry is is uh, back and uh, in a permanent role. Also, we're going to watch a look a little clip a clip or two later. But um, Lord Flashheart is back. Rick Mail as Squadron Leader Flashheart this time because obviously, and I was in the Air Force. The Air Force are the dashing womanizers, and he drops in a couple of times in this one. But he drops into the trenches literally and has some of the funniest lines ever in any show ever uh, some of them uh, there's the one about where Blackadder says I think I'm beginning to understand the suffragette movement and La Flasher says hey listen any girl who wants to chain herself to a fence and suffer a jet movement's alright by me <laughs> it's just the greatest line in history Oh, God. And Rick Mill just eats the senior up. And Miranda oh, Richardson. Yeah. So everyone that's been in previous seasons all gets a role in this. Miranda Richardson's back as Nurse Mary, who is, he meets an unfortunate end, which is a shame. And then Adrian Edmondson as the Baron von Richthofen, who has a infamous showdown with Flash Art during this. And I... And I, I after good, he's full of the oh, brothers in arms in combat and whatever, and like they're not having any of it. <laughs> he's some of my youngest and blondest friends. And the, the little fellow, I'm in the old chateau, no pressure. <laughs> this is when he's got, got the, the go out. Uh, so, not jumping too far ahead, but Blackadder oh. and Baldrick join the Air Force because they heard they were called the 20 Minuters, and they thought that meant. You work 20 minutes a day. Well, no, it's the average life expectancy. Yeah, yeah of, of a pilot in and the World War One. Yeah, and the bit where because they crash land over the in, over the German lines and get captured. But the the other bit is when they're being trained in the uh, by flash art in the classroom. And he goes, "I think you should treat your women, 
treat your aircraft like you treat your women and 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 um whoever george goes well what do you mean sir he goes get inside them six times a day and take them to heaven and back <laughs> yeah oh well, yeah and the line about poo so i actually have some clips just a little bit of clips here and i think the jo poo jock mcplot clip is one of them so let's take a look at the uh this Gently down the stream, belts off, trousers down, isn't life a scream? <laughs> Mind if I use your phone? If word gets out that I'm missing, 500 girls will kill themselves. <laughs> I wouldn't want them on my conscience. Not that they ought to be on my face. <laughs> huh. Just because I can give multiple orgasms to the furniture just by sitting. <laughs> them who they'd prefer to meet, Squadron Commander Flashheart and the man who cleans out the public toilets in Aberdeen. And they go for wee jock poopong mcplop. <laughs> How often I have rehearsed this moment of destiny in my dreams. The valor V to encapsulate. The unspoken nobility of our comradeship. <laughs> uh, uh. How do I look, darling? <laughs> girl bait, sir. Pure bloody girl bait. <laughs> Moustache? The second half starts with Corporal Smith and Johnson as the three silly twerps. All right, sir. The big joke being there's only two of them. <laughs> and did Captain Blackadder shoot the aforementioned pigeon? Yes, he did. <laughs> Can you see Captain Blackadder anywhere in this courtroom? That's him! That's him! That's the man! Don't forget your stick, Lieutenant. Rather, sir. I wouldn't want to face a machine gun without this. <laughs> yeah, one of the last jokes in the thing. That last one yep. there. Uh, but yeah, that um, there's some great clips in there. Uh, the one where he shoots the pigeons on trial, court martial for his life for sh shooting the uh, the general's pet pigeon because they were hungry. Um, and then Bob is there. Bob makes a return. She's yep. Milchett's driver, which Flashheart makes several comments about. Uh, but yeah, that the wee jock poo McPlop line is one of the greatest insults too. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Rick Mail just absolutely lit that one up as fly shirt, but uh anyway, uh yeah, so just to take a look at a couple of the individual episodes in this. Uh we have oops. Captain Cook is the um this is the one where he tries to move his drinks cabinet near to Berlin. This is the one where Blackadder volunteers to be. He's also kind of aware of ways out of the trenches, of course. Um, and he volunteers to be the official war artist. So they're all having their go at painting in the trench. There's Blackadder, George has a go. Baldrick paints, um, <laughs> which George thinks is an impressionist painting. It's just some blobs. And he goes, well, that's, that's supposed to be clouds. He goes, no, it's vomit. Because <laughs> Baldrick says, uh, Blackadder says, nah. It's probably vomit, and yes, it was vomit. So the um, he thinks he's going to get appointed to Paris, but that doesn't. Uh, sent to Paris as the official war as no, no, naturally none of this comes to pass. Uh, corporal punishment is um, he shoots and eats milk. It's pigeon, yeah, speckled Jim. Um, Oh yeah, in 13 years of service to king and country, Edmund has faced danger in Nepal, tra tackling an overspiced curry in Mombasa, confronting 200,000 grass-skirted men, but now he's truly in a pickle. And of course, George is his counsel at the court-martial, and yeah. there's a great clip I wanted to show of him reading out his summing up statement, where it ends with, Captain Blackadder is guilty, and then he sits down. <laughs> And Blackadder turns the sheet of paper over, and there's words on the other side he's supposed to say, of nothing but. <laughs> but then it's too late. But of course, Melcher wants to execute him anyway. This is just a formality. Can't remember how he gets out of it, but he does. We didn't receive any messages, and Captain Blackadder definitely did not shoot this delicious, plump breasted pigeon. <laughs> yep. Uh, so the concert party one is is great. And this is one where um, George dresses up as a woman and, and Melchip falls in love with him and woos him. And George doesn't seem to mind. Well, I guess it's because it's the upper classes, isn't it? You know. Um, so 
Blackadder hates theater and he hates movies and all that stuff and he but he's ordered to put a concert party on uh, and Baldrick does the Charlie Chaplin impression which is the dead slug on his lip and he's like this I think Melcher at the end says, what was this? What was this? The, that slug juggler was trying to do some horrible impression of Charlie Chaplin. He thought he was juggling the slug. The whole thing's just mental. But anyway, the one point, at one point, Blackadder sends, he hates Charlie Chaplin, and he sends a telegram to Hollywood to, to M. Chaplin, can't stand whatever. He insults him, basically. And this is, at the end, he goes, I, uh, about your film's, I just want you to stop, because stop is how he ended the telegram. Yeah. Word stop. So as revenge at the end, Chaplin sends a message to Melchett with a whole load of films and says, "I want you to keep showing these constantly and never stop." <laughs> it is quite a funny telegram. Um, uh, Private plane is the Air Force run where Melchett drop the crash lands in the trench. Oh, got my foot on a Bosch after he kicks black other. Oh, my foot's dirty with Bosch, you know. Um, and then they get captured, and Baron von Richthofen is there, and Flashart shoots him because he doesn't give a shit about nobility. The nobility of combat <laughs> to shoot him. It's a very Indiana Jones moment, very Raiders of the Lost Art moment. Uh, hilarious episode. Rick Mail just absolutely eats it up. General Hospital, there's a German spy who seems to know every move. They even know what underpants Melchit is wearing and, and about his bowel problems. <laughs> They've got every little detail. So they think the spy is in a, a hospital, so they send Edmund into the hospital to catch the spy. And, of course, he falls for Nurse Mary and they spend most of the time in bed and... There's a German, but turns out the German's a British spy, because that would be too obvious, et cetera, et cetera. And eventually, Blackadder fingers Nurse Mary for it with the whole, I asked you the thing about universities you didn't seem to know, and so on and so on. Yeah. She didn't know anything about cricket. Well, she's a woman, of course. Anyway, turns out that George, Lieutenant George, has an uncle in Germany, in the German army, and he writes some letters every week, and he tells him every detail about everything that's going on. So. Mary died for nothing. And then the final episode where they're supposed to go over the top, uh, they're all trying to get out of it. Well, the thing is, George is offered a way out of it by Melchett and he doesn't take it. Yeah. Because he's loyalty to his comrades, basically, but also everyone he ever knew that joined up with has died in the war anyway. Um, it's, it's quite... This is where they start to mix the pathos in, and it's done it very well. It's not jarring. It's not insensitive. It's beautifully filmed. Uh, cheers, Sentient Dildo. Thanks for being here, buddy. Um, Black Arrow tries to get out of it by sticking two pencils up his nose, nose and saying wibble, um, which is the standard way of pretending you're mad, but then um, Douglas, Earl, Douglas Haig is onto that. Well, Haig, he calls it Dougie Haig and reminds him he saved him from the sharpened mango in Sudan. And he tells him to do this, which, which of course, has already been rumbled. Like, Melchett's not going to fall for it. So, um, basically, his um, plans to get out by knowing Dougie Haig don't work. There's no way out of it. Uh, they've all got their stories to tell on it, and it's quite, quite sad. Um, But there's still laughs in it too, like the bit where he yeah. says, oh, George, you know, I almost forgot my swizzle stick or whatever they call it, swizzle stick. Can't face a machine gun without that, that, can you, you know? Yep. And then it ends with, we're in the trench. I mean, I have got some images, so they, I, I can't show the whole clip. I'd love to show the ending where they go over the top and then um, the music, they, you see them in no man's land and they shot it and then the music fades and then you see the field of poppies. Uh, let me just call the images up though. So, so at the end, you see them lined up. Um, 
the last thing I think you hear Blackadder saying is, other than good luck, everybody, is uh, Baldrick says, I've got a cunning plan. And he says, oh, is it as cunning as my plan to get out of here by trying to pretend I'm mad? If so, who would notice everybody's mad? Uh, it's going to have to wait, though, Baldrick, because it's time. So you never hear what Baldrick's cunning plan is at this point. And then, yeah. and then the whistles blow. Good luck, everybody. Darling, Captain Darling is the dirty is done on him by Melchit, and he sends him down there. And Darling says, well, he's tired of looking after his dicky bow and his dicky bladder. Because Darling turns out to be an okay guy after, and when you get underneath all the crap that he's given Baldrick, uh, given Black Anna. They go over the top, the music, it's slowed down. You see the explosions and whatever. Uh, and then it's just this, the theme being played on a solo piano, and then it fade, fades to feel the poppies. I actually, in common with millions of people, I cried. It's so well done, and you're not only yeah. saying goodbye to these characters you've loved, you absolutely get the millions of people who died in reality yeah. at that moment. So, a beautiful... For those that don't know, Poppy, the Poppy is the flower of remembrance for World War One. Yeah, in Britain and in the Commonwealth, we wear uh, poppies and what we call Remembrance Day. November uh, 11th, 11th, 12th, sorry. Which one is it? I can never remember. I can't even remember. It's terrible. I can't even think right now. It actually brings me to tears just thinking of this scene right now. Um, and everybody, it, it gained such uh, the tributes to this final episode and that scene were just incredible, you know. Um, how well is it how good you have to be to end a show a comedy show with something that sensitive and that appropriate it's just incredible so um well done to them you know well done it uh, absolutely even now it chokes me up when i look at it you know when you think of those those poor guys that were so so wasted uh, in that trench warfare but, yeah so well done to the makers of the show the writers the cast, they played it so well. Um, yeah, brilliant, brilliant show. Uh, brilliant, uh, brilliantly ended, uh, but still a lot of laughs in the in the season, even though it was going to end up in this place. Uh, yeah, I would definitely I like put this this episode on par with the ending episode of Mash. Yeah, I mean, both were pretty poignant. I mean, I tend to give this one a, 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 just because of the millions of people that were so brutally wasted in World yeah. War One and the trench warfare. I tend to give this one the slight edge. The ending of Mash was poignant, but this actually made me cry, you know. I'm not ashamed to say it. Yeah, well, the ending of Mash made me cry, so. Yeah, I get it, I get it. And I think yeah. it was a lot of that was because of the... the Nostalgia for the characters and everything yeah. they'd been through. Here, it was also the guys that had. I mean, not that people didn't horribly die in Korea in the Korean War. It's, it's true; many people were sacrificed and died there too. But uh, anyway, brilliant, brilliant show. Kudos in the ending. Those were the four main seasons. There have been three specials. We're going to wrap the show up in a few minutes. But, uh, Black Adder's Christmas Carol, which which I love. If uh, you should watch it, because it's it's the reversal of Dickens. Yeah, it takes uh, Dickens' Christmas Carol and and turns it backwards because Black Adder starts out as a uh, lovely, kind, warm-hearted, giving pie shop owner, or whatever it is, but he's visited by the ghost of Christmas. Uh, who eventually turns him into a mean son of a bitch, <laughs> misanthropic son of a bitch. So it's set during the Victorian era. It is, um, it is a, the, the opposite of Dickens, and it's brilliantly done, especially the twist at the very end, which would have rewarded him if he'd remained virtuous, but because he's a bastard, he doesn't get the reward. Yeah. 
<laughs> it's great because he's taken advantage of it at the beginning. That's the funny thing. Everyone takes advantage of him because he's so warm. And it ends up becoming a kind, a, a cold hearted bastard. Uh, there was another special which was set during, uh, it was called The Cavalier Years, set a uh, very short special done in part of the comic relief shows they have every year in Britain with a comedy, big comedy telethon. And he plays. Um, a supporter of King Charles I and the Cavalier era, so coming up against Cromwell. It's pretty good. It's got a great I haircut. I haven't seen that one. Yeah, it's not. It's it's only a short one. It's I don't think it's a long episode. It's pretty short. Uh, it's great haircut because <laughs> it's set during that era. Uh, but it fills in a, ba a gap in the timeline of the Blackadder family, in a sense. And then there's the back and forth special which was done uh to be shown at the millennium dome in 1999 in britain at, in london which of course they dismantled after the millennium yeah. and it's basically a time travel romp where he goes back and forward through various bits of history with baldrick collecting things yeah. and uh, it's quite funny it's not bad it was a bit of a reunion for the cast Done about 10 years later than uh, back and forth. Uh, and it's got elements of other time travel things that we've seen in it. And it's, but it's quite amusing. I do particularly like um, Stephen Fry's outfit here. Yeah. <laughs> Which itself is worth watching just for the last. It's got, that's got very Life of Brian vibes, that scene right there. <laughs> anyway. So that rounds up the official Blackadder releases. Uh, I couldn't do, we, we've we got a lot of the wine li one liners out. I couldn't do the whole thing. Well, thanks for being here, D Bud, by the way, and thanks for modding uh, as usual. All you folks that are modding in the chat Davina, D Bud, um, Christian, uh, Sentient Dildo were here. I do appreciate it very much. I know we don't get a lot of controversy in our chats, but thank you very much for taking care of anything. Uh, yeah, so. If you've never seen Blackadder, go out and watch particularly seasons two, three, and four. You won't regret it. Six episodes in each, so it's not a big time commitment. You can watch them all and binge them all in one night. And they're extremely sharp, very funny, great performances. It's one of the all-time classics of world comedy, never mind British comedy. Yeah. Uh, towering achievement, I think. Um, some of the funniest insults and one-liners you'll ever hear. I'd love to have shown more. We couldn't. Um, yeah. They dismantled the Millennium Dome because that was always their intention. It was always meant to be temporary, and then they were going to build other things on that site. Seems like a total waste of time and money to me. But uh, So, yeah, it, it, Davina summed it up very well, uh, which is it covered a wide gamut of emotions throughout the series, not just slapstick and put-downs. Yeah. You grew to love these characters, even the horrible ones. Everybody had some part to play in the saga. Uh, it, uh, I, I've watched them dozens of times, and I, and I will continue to keep watching them. So, so John, my friend, any final words about this wonderful show? It's cunning. It's cunning. It is very cunning. Is it so cunning you could pin a tail on it though and call it a fox has it got a degree in cunning from oxford oxford university but it's moved on it's now working in the un at the high commission for international cunning planning uh right yes there's some cunning stunts there that's for sure yep uh yeah i mean we could just quote if we had the scripts we could quote blackadder all night it's just the repartee is just incredible um we only literally only touched on some of them. I can't even, I'll remember them all when we're off air. Yeah, that, that's how it works. Um, but I do love the one about subtle plans are here again. <laughs> so, uh, Imp, have you seen and heard anything that would make you want to watch this show? Uh, yeah, I kind of did add it to my soon-to-watch list. I got a few things that I've added there recently, and that's on there now, too. Cool. No, you won't regret it, mate. It's, it's definitely worth the time. There are laugh out loud moments through all of it. Um, I say, if you watch season one, which you should to be completest, it's not as not that funny. 
get over that though, and then go to seasons two, three, four, magnificent. Just mm. don't. It's in the, the the top five of all time of all comedies ever. I think. And only so. drink between episodes because if you try and drink during an episode, I guarantee it's going to come out your nose. Yeah, it will. <laughs> it's amongst other things. And when Flash Art appears, it's just yeah. incredible. Yeah, great stuff. Uh, well, anyway, that was the first of our cult comedy crew shows. Um, and no doubt over time we'll get slicker. And I'll be able yep. to play more clips, hopefully in future, depending on the show. Uh, but thank you very much, everyone, for being here. Thanks to those who super chatted. Appreciate it very much. Helping keep uh, keep me in whiskey. Um, or certainly small, very small one, miniatures of whiskey at the moment. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I can't really drink right now because of medical reasons. But, um, yeah, same here. Uh, yeah, I can't drink. So, um, but yeah, thank you to everyone in the chat. Appreciate you being here, both here and those who watched over in Rumble. Uh, please, you know, subscribe. Uh, if you're not subscribed, I'm sure you all are. Leave a like, um, etc. All that good stuff. Appreciate it very much. Uh, if you are not busy next Monday, then we have a very special It's Only Talk and Roll where we invite, uh, we have a guest, Graham Bonnet, singer of Rainbow, uh, Alcatraz, Michael Schenker group, amongst many other great albums. So he's going to be guesting on the show. We're really looking forward to that one. I'm going to be fanboy, complete fanboy that day. Yeah. Uh, so that's next Monday. Uh, the Monday after that, we also have a very special guest. It's a guy called Kevin Harrington, who was Beatles Rudy from the White Album era onwards. Um, he is the redhead in the room in things like Let It Be and Get Back. You'll see him trundling cups of tea and setting up amps. And the famous shot of him holding the lyrics up to Dig a Pony on the rooftop so John can read them as he's singing it. He's guesting on the show to talk nice. about that. Oh, it's going to be great. I'm a huge Beatles head, of course, to talk about that. But his career after that, where he road managed for Derek and the Dominoes, the Stones, Judas Priest, Motorhead, many, Motorhead. many other acts, many other great acts. That's, it's going to be a great show. So you have me at Lemmy. And you at Lemmy. Go to the <laughs> chat. Go, just click on the bell for notifications so you don't miss those shows. Our great friend Darius has sent another $3 super sticker. Hands doing the sign of the horns with sparkles around. And that's what next week's show is going to be all about with Graham Bonnet. Uh, I cannot leave you then without a video clip. Let me find one for you. Uh, oh, let's, let's, do, let's do this one. Infamy! Infamy! They've all got it in for me! <laughs> so, thank you, Darius. Thank you, everybody, for being here. I appreciate you all very much. Hope you enjoyed this. John, you got anything else you want to plug? No, uh, Pop Culture Minefield. Just on uh, Monday through Friday. Uh, in the morning... Cool. Uh, in the afternoons for the weekend, and Brian does a show on Thursdays. Yeah, this Thursday, Thursday morning, 10 a.m. This Thursday, it's going to be Wilco and Mal from the Rowdies again. They're both in Spain right now, so we're going to be talking to them. Cool. Uh, but yeah, thanks for being here for that. This join and for those imp, my friend, you got anything you want to plug? Not at the moment, no. Uh, the combination of personal issues and tech issues all hitting at once kind of slowed everything down. Yeah. Well, thanks for being here, mate. Really oh, yeah. appreciate it. It's always good to have you. Appreciate it very much. Thank very you all. Looking forward to next week. Oh yeah, next week's going to be great. We'll be hearing. You'll all be hearing a lot about that during the week as we plug it. So thanks everybody. Have a great night. Appreciate you all being here. Take care and keep on rocking. See you soon. <laughs>